What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it. Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. As ever, succinct questions and answers to match will enable more members to take part. And I call Eleanor Whittam, Whittam, question number one. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to increase the capacity of on-street charging infrastructure as drivers switch to electric vehicles. Minister Graham Day. Sign officer, we've already invested more than £45 million to develop the publicly available Charge Place Scotland network, which now consists of over 1,900 charge points across the country. The network includes a number of public charging hubs already available in some towns and cities, with more planned throughout Scotland. And we continue to work with local authority charge point hosts to strengthen and expand the network. This year, we'll provide funding to enable £2 million of on-street charging projects across Scotland, specifically for those areas with, uh, without access to off-street parking. Eleanor Whitton. There are many rural villages and market towns in my constituency where properties are hard to pavement, such as my own, and as such do not have private driveways. Currently, these properties do not qualify for the grant funding for the installation of home chargers, leaving many citizens to rely on on-street charging infrastructure should they wish to reduce their carbon footprint. Is the Scottish Government aware of these situations across Scotland and what considerations are being made for the many people who will be in this situation? Minister. So, you know, so, uh, as an MSP for a rural constituency myself, I am very much aware of these issues. And I hope Ms Witham will take assurance from the fact that Government officials are um, working with the South Ayrshire Council to support the installation of chargers that will provide for people without access to off-street charging in Straighton, Barhill, uh, Daly and Mabel. Uh, the Scottish Government is also currently consulting on requirements for installing charge points in car parks of residential and non-residential buildings, which will further enhance access to electric vehicle charging across Scotland. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. South Lancashire Council said it would install over 100 electrical vehicle charging points, but it's cut this plan by 42 per cent. And notwithstanding the challenges of the pandemic, a £1 million fleet of electric vehicles has barely left the council car park in a year, with charging being a big concern. So what can the Scottish Government do to help South Lancashire Council expand local charging networks and make people feel more confident about using electric vehicles? Minister? Uh, well, as the member will, will understand, um, any actions that South Lanarkshire Council have taken will be a matter for, for them uh, to defend and to explain. However, I, I, to answer her point about engagement with the Scottish Government, the Scottish Government is actively engaged with local authorities in seeking to encourage the, uh, this, and that is our direction of travel, and we expect local authorities to join us in that. Jackie Dunbar. 
Thank you. Um, I thank the Minister for his previous answer in regards to how many EV charging points are in Scotland. Um, can he expand on that a little bit and, uh, and tell us how much that is compared to the rest of the UK? Minister. Thank you, officer. The most recent statistics show that Scotland has over 2,500 publicly available chargers, which represent 47 chargers per 100,000 of population, compared to 36 chargers per 100,000 of population for the whole of the UK. Importantly, within this, Scotland has the highest proportion of rapid chargers and is well ahead of the rest of the UK, with 12 per 100,000, compared to a UK average of 6.8 per 100,000. But of course, there is much more to do because the uptake of electrical vehicles is showing a welcome increase. Question number two, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent research which suggests that chain stores in Scotland closed at a rate of 30 per week during the first six months of 2021. Minister Tom Arthur. We understand the difficulties faced by Scotland's retail industry as a result of the global pandemic. In recognition of that, the Scottish Government has provided businesses with more than £4.3 billion in support since the start of the pandemic. We continue to support the retail sector and other businesses as we rebuild the economy following the pandemic, including through the work of the Retail Strategy, the Town Centre Review and City Centre Recovery Task Force, as well as the Scotland Loves Local £10 million multi-year support programme. Liam Kerr. The Centre for Cities report says Aberdeen has the UK's fourth lowest high street spend and around 90 units currently lie empty. Now, RGU and Aberdeen Inspired suggest reasons for this include the business rates and the overheads, and others point to how slowly the SNP got COVID relief out the door. Aberdeen Council has a master plan, but the reinstatement of 100% business rates in six months' time is casting a long shadow. So what plans does the Minister have to introduce a fairer business rate system and restore a level playing field with England on the higher property rate? Minister. Um, as the member will be aware, um, in Scotland we have the most generous package of rates relief anywhere in the UK. Indeed, we were the only part of the UK to give full NDR relief for hospitality, leisure, aviation and retail. And that was an investment of over £700 million. Now, as a member will appreciate, decisions around NDR will be taken as part of the budget process. But I very much look forward to his constructive and informed contribution to that process later this year. Question number three, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government if there are timescales and numbers of units um, for the rollout of electric vehicle charging sites across Scotland. Minister Graham Day. There's a, a, President Officer, there's a wide range of factors that influence and ultimately determine the types, numbers and timescales for the rollout of electric charging infrastructure. This includes technology developments in terms of vehicles, batteries and charging equipment, as well as the impact of other actions supporting the Scottish Government's ambition to reduce the total number of privately owned cars and reduce car kilometres by 20% by 2030. Therefore, it is not possible to specify exact timescales and numbers. Bill Kidd. Well, I thank the Minister for that response. Electric charging will um, obviously become an increasingly essential part of our infrastructure. And I know that Charge Place Scotland Network is supported by the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland. Will the cost of charging be determined by government or market conditions? And has the government discussed what action can be taken to ensure the cost of electric charging is maintained at an affordable rate? Minister. President Officer, Bill Kidd raises a critical point. If the switch to electric vehicles is to work for all of our population, then people need to be able to afford to do that. Currently, tariffs are set by charge point owners to cover the cost of electricity provided, as well as maintaining and growing the network. And there are other private networks operating in Scotland that charge on a commercial basis. But regardless of the source of investment, this government is committed to delivering a charging network that works for all of Scotland all the time. So we are continuing to engage with charging providers, energy network companies and regu regulators to ensure the charging network is affordable. Question number four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will implement Part 3 of the Transport Scotland Act 2019 to allow local authorities to bring forward proposals to directly run bus services in their area. Minister Graham Day. President, President Officer, as I outlined in my letter to all members in June, work to implement Part 3 uh, of the Act resumed earlier this year following a pause necessitated by the pandemic. We are consulting currently uh, to help inform the development of the necessary second legislation and guidance. The consultation closes on the 6 October, and I would, of course, encourage all interested parties, if they have not already done so, to feed into this process. 
Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will know that it's more than two years since I proposed an amendment to the Transport Bill to lift that historic ban on councils directly running bus services or establishing municipal bus companies. So, so can he give us a time scale when he expects those powers to actually come into force? Because councils do want to get on with the job of delivering bus services to their community, and will he also ensure direct funding is made available to councils to enable them to use those powers, including capital and revenue start-up costs? Minister. President Officer, let me begin by recognising the constructive way in which Colin Smith engaged in the Transport Bill and those provisions. Um, he is asking for a timetable. In essence, we would expect to have the findings of the consultation available to us towards the end of the year. And I offer him um, uh, this assurance that we will look to move on this as quickly as possible, because like him, I see this as a, a real priority. In terms of funding, as he knows, we have committed to establishing the Community Bus Fund for this purpose and others. And as we see the outcome of the recommendations from the consultation, we will be able to, to move forward on that also. And I am happy to work with him on this moving forward. Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The original question which Colin Smith asked was, um, when will the Government implement Part 3 of the Transport Act? I am not sure we have had an answer to that. Uh, although the Minister said the consultation uh, will close by the end of the year, um, can he actually give an answer to the original question uh, when he anticipates uh, this uh, part, part three of the Transport Act being implemented. Minister. I think I did answer that question, and, and for an experienced parliamentarian, I would have thought Mr Simpson would have picked up on that. As he knows, we will need to develop the secondary legislation. There will have to be time, time found in the parliamentary timetable. The committee will want to scrutinise it, and I would anticipate it being done as quickly as it is possible to do that. Question number five, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the duelling of the A96. Minister Graeme Day. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to improving the A96, and while the current plan is to fully duel the A96 between Inverness and Aberdeen, as part of the cooperation agreement with the Scottish Green Party, we have agreed to conduct a transparent, evidence based review of the programme, which will report by the end of 2022. Tess White. Minister. Police Scotland data shows 195 people in the last three years in the North East have been involved in a crash, with at least one fatality. Despite the review currently underway, and despite the safety concerns of local communities, and despite what you've just said now, Green MSP Maggie Chapman believes, and I quote, it will not be viable to fully duel the A96 route. Can you please say, do you agree or not agree with Green MSP Maggie Chapman? Minister. Presiding Officer, uh, Maggie Chapman, like any other MSP in this chamber, is entitled to their view. As a minister in this government, I am committed to the review process. The review process will determine how we take this forward. But I want to go back to the start of that question, because if the, um, uh, the inference was that somehow safety concerns along this route would be ignored, that is reprehensible and it is untrue. Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the traffic congestion experienced in Nairn by the local residents can be as bad as that experienced in Glasgow or Edinburgh, except that in Nairn there is only one road uh, for citizens to use, namely the A96, which goes through the town. It delays of up to an hour can be experienced to get from one end of the town to the other during the tourism season. Therefore, can I ask the Minister, will he approve and commence the initiation of the tender process for the delivery of the preferred route agreed uh, of the duelling of the A9 between Inverness and Aldern, including the Nairn bypass? And will he accept my invitation as the constituency member to come and meet local people to hear for himself the strength of views and feelings on this matter. Minister. I'm happy to commit to such a visit, although I'm not in any way unaware of the strength of the views, given the many conversations I've had with Mr Ewing, who's a strong advocate for this. And I'm sure the member will very much welcome the fact that what is committed, regardless to on the A96, includes the bypassing in there and the dueling 
uh, from Inverness to Nairn. But as a former minister, Mr Ewing knows there are processes around such projects uh, which have to be followed. That said, I give him the assurance we will move as quickly as we can to progress this work. Question number six, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will support young people to find rewarding and sustainable employment. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is taking forward a range of actions to support young people to achieve their potential. Through our delivery of the Young Persons Guarantee, we have invested an additional £130 million, which aims to provide at least 24,000 new and enhanced opportunities for young people who need support finding and sustaining employment. We are clear that opportunities created through the guarantee must provide fair work and be underpinned by a package of training that supports young people transition into employment. Our developing the young workforce activity is well embedded and is being enhanced by nearly 300 DYW school coordinators who play a vital role in increasing opportunities for work-based learning for pupils. And recognise the importance of good quality careers advice, former General Secretary of the Scottish Trades Union Congress, Graham Smith, a non-executive director at Skills Development Scotland, is leading a review of the career service. Julian Martin. Thank the Minister for that answer. Many of the businesses in my constituency of Aberdeenshire East are SMEs, and I would like to encourage more of them to get involved in providing opportunities to the Young Persons Guarantee. Can the Minister outline what support we are giving to those businesses that are possibly too small to have training or HR departments to play their part in the scheme and unlock the potential of our young people? Minister. Uh, well, I, I can say there is uh, good uh, news uh, in that regard. Part of the Young Persons Guarantee, we are working closely with employers to encourage them to sign up to the five asks that are proportionate to the size of any businesses. And indeed, of those who have signed up, over two thirds are in fact SMEs. So that is, I believe, a uh, testament to uh, uh, the uh, willingness and commitment of SMEs to make a difference. Of course, uh, we do want to see more uh, taking part, developing young workforce regional groups and local authority employability. Uh, Leeds can play an important uh, role in that, and indeed so can we as members of the Scottish Parliament. We can play a leadership role in encouraging uh, local employers too, and I welcome uh, Ms Martin's commitment in that regard, and I'm sure it's shared across the Chamber. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. My Minister will be aware that yesterday the figures came out in regard to unemployment with those with disabilities, and the more people with disabilities are now unemployed than there were this time last year. The gap between uh, England and Scotland has grown wider, and you're far less likely to get a job here in Scotland if you're disabled than you are down south. Why does the Minister think that is happening, and what is he and his government going to do about it? Minister. Well, I am aware of uh, that disappointing trend. Mr Balfour, will we know that is uh, the first time in some while in which we have moved backwards in terms of the disability employment uh, gap. What we will uh, be doing is responding as he and other members would rightly expect us to do. We will be introducing uh, Scotland's first national transitions to adulthood strategy in this uh, term. We will be implementing the Morgan Review recommendations for additional support uh, for learning. Our uh, Fair Start Scotland programme continues to ha uh, play a role and will continue to work to our Disability Employment Action Plan, which seeks to half, at least half the disability employment gap over the coming two decades. Question number seven, Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to close the poverty-related attainment gap, including in response to the cut coming to universal credit. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Record investment of £215 million this year, including a £20 million pupil equity funding premium, is providing additional support for children and young people who need it most. This is the first investment of our £1 billion commitment to tackle the poverty related attainment gap and support education recovery this parliamentary term. However, tackling the poverty-related attainment gap cannot be done by education or schools alone. The Scottish Government analysis indicates that the UK Government's decision to cut universal credit could push 60,000 people in Scotland, including 20,000 children, into poverty. And that's why the UK Government must reverse this harmful and senseless cut immediately. Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I refer colleagues to my register of interest. Clearly, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has just said, this can't just be about education, though I note the substantial investment in our schools. But the best way to narrow the poverty related attainment gap is to address poverty. When a £6 billion cut is coming forward from the Tories to cut universal credit, removing £1,000 a year from low income families, and a £500 million replication of the Scottish Welfare Fund announced this morning, will go no way to make up for that poverty being suffered, what impact will these cuts have on the ability of the government to close the poverty-related attainment gap? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, I quite agree with Neil Gray that an announcement today of a £500 million fund does not in any way uh, begin to start compensating the £6 billion cut to the universal credit. Uh, that is why we are doing what we can within the Scottish Government. I have spoken about the record funding that we have to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap, but Neil Gray is quite right. We need to also tackle the, the root causes of poverty, and one of the root causes is the fundamentally different way that the UK Government has a social security system which seems to punish those uh, of our most poorest in our society. And given the votes in the universal credit debate this week, I think that is also a view shared by the Scottish Tories, which is exceptionally disappointing. We will continue to do what we can within the Scottish Government to support our people. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. I intend taking both constituency and general supplementaries after question two. Members wishing to ask such supplementaries should press the requests to speak buttons during question two. And I'll keep a note of members who press and may take further supplementaries from members if we have any time in hand after question six. And members wishing to ask a supplementary question to questions three to six, please press during the relevant question. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The SNP's vaccination passport scheme comes into effect in just a few hours' time. And while the judgment has been delivered, businesses were still in court trying to halt this scheme as late as this morning. Guidance is still being published. The app was to be launched today. So far, we've got the app to check vaccine passports, but we don't have the app for vaccine passports. Everything about this has been left to the last minute. This isn't the way to run any scheme, let alone one that will affect people right across Scotland. The First Minister and I disagree strongly about this policy. My party want it scrapped, but surely even she must accept that the scheme is not ready and needs to be delayed. First Minister. Uh, no, I... I do not uh, agree with that. Douglas Ross, uh, perhaps understandably from his perspective, wants to simply gloss over uh, the uh, decision of the Court of Session uh, this morning, rejecting the application for interim interdict. So, therefore, let me uh, summarise and paraphrase uh, the reasons that were given for that rejection, uh, that the scheme had been consulted upon, uh, that there had been the opportunity to take part in that consultation. The scheme introduced was not disproportionate, irrational or unreasonable. Um, it it was reasonable to bring in the phased approach. There was no discrimination. Um, and in summary, the scheme was attempting to address legitimate concerns in a reasonable and balanced way. Uh, all along, presiding officer, I've been very candid and clear. None of us uh, want to be in this position. None of us want to be having to take any of the steps we've had to take over 18 months now to seek to contain a virus, keep people safe and try to limit the health and other damage that this virus does. But we are still in this virus. There are still around 1,000 people in our hospitals because of it uh, or with it or because of it. And of course, we face what may be the most difficult winter any of us can imagine. This is a targeted and proportionate way to try to reduce the harm that the virus will do over the winter months while we'll keep our economy fully open, fully functioning and fully trading. Um, and the judgment from the court this morning, uh, I think, recognises both those reasons and the way in which the government has gone about this. We will continue to engage with business, uh, not just in the run-up uh, to the enforcement of this coming into uh, place on the 18th of October after the legal obligation comes into force tomorrow, uh, but we will do that afterwards as well to make sure that we are listening, understanding, but that all of us are working collectively to try to keep the country as safe as possible as we go through these winter months. Douglas Ross. The First Minister claims she has been candid and clear. If only her vaccine passport scheme was candid yeah. and clear. Yeah. And she says I glossed over the legal challenge. I mentioned it right at the top of yeah. my question. But surely, surely it shows how badly the government have worked with businesses that they had to take this last minute legal challenge and they were still in court with her government this morning. Sectors are desperately trying to stop it from going ahead because they are so worried about the impact it will have on their businesses and Scottish jobs. This scheme starts at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. But by tomorrow night, we could be in the ridiculous situation where hundreds of people will be at venues where they need a vaccine passport to get in. But if the music is turned off, 
the exact same people suddenly don't need a vaccine passport. Yeah. Yeah. At the football this weekend, thousands of people will need to go through vaccine passport checks in a very short space of time without any public campaign to inform them of the procedures they will have to go through. Doesn't the First Minister realise that to everyone in the real world, this looks like a complete farce? First Minister. Uh, again, no, I don't. I think the vast majority of people across Scotland, while uh, very few, if any, uh, like the measures we're having to take to control this virus, understand the reasons for these measures. And actually, would prefer a situation where people are being asked to show proof of vaccination uh, than a situation where venues like nightclubs or large-scale events have to stop or close again. Uh, that's the balance we're seeking to strike. And in terms of uh, the legal challenge, uh, any organisation in a democracy has a right to challenge decisions of government right up until uh, those decisions come into force and indeed afterwards. Uh, interestingly, I think the right to judicial review is a right that the Tories south of the border are seeking to take away uh, completely, if I understand it, or at least limit it uh, considerably. Uh, but the judgment uh, of uh, Lord Burns this morning is very clear and very emphatic on the point about the fact that some venues and some circumstances are covered and not others. Again, I'm paraphrasing and summarising, uh, but the reasons uh, recognised that the, it was widely known that the combination of alcohol, dancing, late nights uh, inside created a high-risk environment for the transmission of COVID uh, that doesn't occur uh, to the same extent in other venues. Uh, so there's no perfection uh, when you are dealing with an infectious virus. All of the steps and measures we have to take are imperfect, um, and of course they are far from ideal. But we can't simply wish COVID away. We've got to take the steps to get uh, cases back under control. And as I said the other day, and I think it is worth repeating, um, Douglas Ross over recent months uh, has opposed almost every step we've tried to take from face coverings through to uh, COVID certification. If I'd listened to Douglas Ross, then we probably wouldn't be in the position we're in now, thankfully, of having cases on a downward path. So perhaps it's Douglas Ross that needs to reflect a bit more uh, on some of the arguments he makes in this chamber. Douglas Ross. If the First Minister listened to those of us on these benches, she wouldn't be introducing a scheme from 5am tomorrow that sees hundreds of people get their vaccine passport checked as they walk into a venue, but the music gets unplugged and suddenly, miraculously, they don't need a vaccine passport at all. Yeah, and if she had sense. listened Absolutely to these not. benches, she wouldn't be introducing a scheme from 5am tomorrow, which can't be enforced for more than a fortnight yeah. further on. Businesses have never had a tougher time than right now, but they're getting guidance on vaccine passports at the very last minute. And the evidence case for them, if it can be called that because there's barely any evidence for this policy, appeared before a Scottish Parliament committee for the first time this morning. There are so many flaws littered throughout this scheme and proper consideration hasn't taken place. Let's look at just one key part of this legislation. Who have the Scottish Government consulted with over Regulation 16A and what was the outcome of those discussions? First Minister. Uh, we've consulted with a range of stakeholders. Uh, I'm more than happy to go into uh, detail or provide. Look, I don't have the regulations in front of me right now. I'm very happy to uh, come back afterwards and go through every uh, particular regulation and who precisely we have consulted on. But let's come back uh, to the heart of the matter here. And uh, there is one point I uh, agree uh, with Douglas uh, Ross on. If we'd listened to him and the Conservatives, then many of the steps we've taken to try to get COVID uh, cases back under control again, we wouldn't have taken. Uh, but I'm afraid the consequence of that may well have been that COVID cases would still have been rising because Douglas Ross just a few weeks ago was complaining about the continued legal requirement uh, to wear face coverings um, and has opposed literally almost everything uh, that we have done. Um, so I, I think this is just part of a pattern and probably will lead most people to think uh, that it's a good thing that Douglas Ross is not standing here facing uh, having to take these decisions. Um, Douglas Ross. Um, Douglas Ross. Thank you, presiding officer. <laughs> My apologies. I, I assumed that the first minister had finished. 16 years. First minister. I was actually going to address the point, uh, presiding officer, about evidence because evidence is important and. 
Uh, Douglas Ross uh, likes quite legitimately to quote uh, different people uh, before this chamber. So in, in terms of the, the committee that was scrutinising this uh, just this very morning, uh, let me reflect on the comments of Professor Christopher uh, Dye, Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Oxford, uh, where uh, he commends uh, the evidence paper um, and says, uh, and he does say with one or two comments or queries, I broadly agree with its recommendations. I think it's a very good report actually and I agree with its basic recommendations, which is that vaccine certification is a useful device and approach to support the vaccination programme in Scotland. Uh, so that takes us back to the heart of this matter. Uh, we have an infectious virus circulating. It has taken far too many lives. It is still doing too much damage. A thousand people are in our hospitals uh, with COVID right now as we speak. It is incumbent on government to take responsible, reasonable and targeted measures to keep the country safe as we go into this potentially very difficult winter. And that's a responsibility I am going to uh, continue to treat and discharge with the utmost seriousness. Douglas Ross. Presiding officer, the First Minister had two bites at the cherry to answer that question, and she couldn't do it. There's only half a dozen regulations to her legislation that comes into effect from 5am tomorrow. If it's somehow unreasonable to know about Regulation 16A, it was discussed in the COVID committee this morning, which her Deputy First Minister appeared in front of. She can turn to him to ask for answers. He doesn't seem to know either. And it just shows the lack of engagement, the lack of consultation, and the lack of understanding from the SM about their own policy. The government seem to be making this up as they go along. Just look at what John Swinney said at the COVID committee this morning. He couldn't even tell the members what will be the criteria to end the COVID passport scheme. He's whispering in the First Minister's ear, so let's hope that she can tell us, because he couldn't at the committee this morning. The SNP government is the only one in Europe to run a scheme like this, relying purely on the vaccination status of people and banning them from venues unless they can produce official paperwork. The only government in Europe forcing these higher costs onto businesses and the only government in Europe forcing such restrictive rules onto the public. Nicola Sturgeon wants independence in Europe. Well, she's got it. She's completely alone in pursuing yes. this shambles of a scheme. So can I ask, why are countries across Europe wrong? Thousands of Scottish businesses, the Scottish Beer and Pub Association, the Scottish Hospitality Group, the Nighttime Industries Association, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, the Scottish Licensed Trade Association and the Scottish yeah. Human Rights Commission. Why are they all wrong but Nicola Sturgeon's right? First Minister. It's interesting that in, in the course of uh, that ramble, uh, Douglas Ross appears to have completely changed the basis for his opposition to COVID certification. Uh, up until now, um, I understood, uh, Anna Sauer, I think, changed the basis of his about a week ago, but up until now, I understood that it was because it was far, far too difficult uh, for businesses to comply with this. Now it's because uh, we're only requiring uh, proof of vaccine and not proof of a negative test. And I've set out clearly, firstly, why we're not doing that at this point and uh, the fact that we will keep that under review. But the reason we're not doing it right now, uh, principally, is because we're trying to drive up vaccination rates. Uh, we've set out the rationale, uh, we've set out the reasons, and we've set out the detail. Uh, a court has looked at this over uh, the past 24 hours, and I've already summarised the judgment of the court uh, delivered just this very morning. The committee has scrutinised this again this morning. We have listened to businesses, which is why we have delayed enforcement to allow businesses a grace period to test their arrangements in practice. But I come back to the central point. I am left wondering uh, what exactly it is that Douglas Ross does support us doing to keep COVID under control, to protect people's health, to protect our economy and to save lives. Because the position he is taking right now is simply to oppose everything this government does uh, simply for the sake of opposition. At any time that is irresponsible. But in the face of a deadly virus, that is particularly irresponsible from the Conservatives. Question, question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, we are facing a cost of living crisis. Uh, today, furlough comes to an end, a lifeline for so many. Next week, universal credit will be cut for millions of people across the country. Uh, I'm sure on that, the First Minister and I agree that that is a shameful mistake by the Tory government. 
And tomorrow the energy cap will rise by £139, meaning that many will face the choice between eating and heating this winter. Even before this cost of living crisis, this was an unacceptable choice facing too many people in our country, particularly our elderly. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber, right now, how many people in Scotland are living in fuel poverty and how many of them are pensioners? First Minister. Uh, far too many. Uh, with apologies to Anna Sarwa, I don't have the precise uh, figures in front of me right now, but I know uh, that it is too many. Of course, this government is taking action uh, to try to help uh, people on the lowest incomes with the cost of living crisis, because I absolutely agree that is what uh, we are facing. Uh, so, for example, uh, by the end of October, we will make a £130 uh, support payment uh, for every household to receive council tax reduction. Um, uh, that's an investment of of up to £65 million. It will benefit over 500,000 households. Of course, we have introduced the child payment, which is also intended to help those living in poverty. I suspect Anna Sarwar's next uh, question uh, is going to be to ask me for us to make additional payments to people uh, living in fuel poverty. And I would say this, I think we can hopefully agree between us that if this government had the wherewithal to do that, we would do that because we all want to help those on the lowest incomes. But we get again to the nub of a matter here. This government uh, and, and any uh, government in the Scottish Parliament is simply unable to continue uh, week after week, month after month, year after year, mitigating the impact of reserved policies from a limited and finite devolved budget. It simply is not possible uh, without hitting the devolved responsibilities uh, that we have the responsibility for hard. And that comes back to this matter. If we want this parliament, as I do, to be able to do all of the things that no doubt Anna Sarwar is going to ask me to do, we can't uh, just wish the ends. We have to give this parliament the means to do it. We have to give this parliament the powers and we have to ensure that it is this parliament that holds the resources. Anything short of that from Anna Sarwar, I'm afraid, is just an empty soundbite. And what we face right now is far too serious for that. Anna Sarwar. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is far too serious, and that's why uh, the soundbites are coming from the First Minister. Uh, we do have means, and we should use the means we have. Uh, we have the power to have the winter fuel payment from this Parliament, but the First Minister has chosen to give that power back to the very Tory government she rightfully uh, criticises. So let's use the power and make a difference. And on the question I asked the First Minister, the answer is 613,000 people living in fuel poverty. And of that, over 200,000 are believed to be pensioners. That is one in four households across our country unable to make ends meet and forced to make heartbreaking choices right now. This week we heard that Scotland had recorded the first death by starvation of an older person in a decade. An older person in our country, one of the richest in the world, starving to death in their home. First Minister, words cannot describe how tragic and awful that is. And words are not going to keep war people warm this winter. The Scottish Government can and must take action now. Earlier this week, we called for a £70 increase in winter fuel payments to help the poorest pensioners this winter. And today we learned that the Scottish Government will receive an additional £41 million to support hard-pressed families over the coming months. So now we can go even further. So will the First Minister enhance the winter fuel payment, not just for the poorest pensioners, but also give targeted support to struggling families, for example, where there is a child with a disability, and for those in receipt of a council tax reduction? We have the means. Let's use the means. First Minister. Well, firstly, the, the £41 million pounds that Anna Sarwar is referring to, I assume, is what will flow from the announcement of the UK Government this morning uh, of a £500 million pounds fund UK-wide uh, for uh, low-income families. What I'd say, and I'm surprised to uh, hear Anna Sarwar talk about that positively, because this is uh, an announcement from a Tory Government who is taking, which is taking £6 billion pounds out of the pockets of the lowest-income families through the universal credit cut, and is expecting praise, which they seem to have just got from Anna Sarwar for putting £500 million back. It is an absolute disgrace 
and an insult. But every penny of consequentials that we get from that will go to support low-income families, and I give that uh, absolute commitment. And that will be in addition to the support that I've already talked about, uh, a £130 support payment by the end of October that will go to every household who did receive council tax uh, reduction, uh, supporting over 500,000 uh, households across the country. Uh, we're also doubling the carers' allowance supplement in December to try to help uh, carers uh, with the cost of living increase. And as I already said, we've introduced the, the child payment. In fact, the Social Security Scotland, which I uh, visited in Dundee just yesterday, is delivering 11 benefits already. Seven of them don't exist anywhere else. That's how seriously we are taking the obligation to help those most in need. But I come back to the point. Our resources are finite. What Anna Sarwar is asking me to do is to, within a devolved budget that is already allocated, is to find money again to mitigate the impact of reserve policies. Wouldn't it make more sense for us to have the powers here in this Parliament with the accompanying resources so that we could take different decisions? So make two open offers to Anna Sarwar. Firstly, back the Scottish Government in that call to devolve all of Social Security to this Parliament and not just some of it. And secondly, if he does want us to make another payment, then by all means, if he wants to come to me and say where in the already allocated Scottish budget uh, we take over and above the £41 million that he's spoken to, which I've already said will be fully allocated, if he wants anything over and above that, then come and tell me where within the Scottish budget he wants me to take that money from. And I'm happy to listen to him if he's prepared to do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm very conscious of time, and I would be grateful if we could have shorter questions and responses. Um, Anna Sarwar. I think the problem is the First Minister wants to shout pre-prepared attack lines rather than actually listen to what I'm saying. Um, I wasn't welcoming the new money as some kind of relief to universal credit. I was actually taking seriously what the First Minister often says, is if you've got a proposal, tell us where the money is coming from. And I've told her quite clearly there's £41 million coming there. Let's use it to make a difference. She also gives examples. She also gives examples, which I also welcome, but they were announced before we had a cost of living crisis. And what I say to you, First Minister, is we can shout about what new powers we want, Let's use the powers we have to change people's lives in the here and now. Because this is urgent. People are facing rising costs today. Energy bills will rise tomorrow. People need help now. We can't dither and delay when families need that reassurance. The Scottish Government has the power to do something about it. We know the additional £41 million is on its way. And families need to know that support is on its way too because warm words will be cold comfort for people who risk suffering this winter. So can the First Minister guarantee to the Chamber that the Government will act, that she will back our plan and make sure that the £41 million gets into people's pockets before it's too late? First Minister. I, I think people watching this will have heard me say every penny of the £41 million uh, will go to help directly low-income families. Now, Anna Sarwar says that that's where he thinks the funding for his proposal should come from. Uh, he announced his proposal before we knew about that £41 million. So I'm assuming, and maybe I'm getting it wrong in terms of what exactly his proposal is, that the £70 payment is over and above that. And all I'm saying to him is, well, tell us where you think that money should come. Every penny of the £41 million, assuming it does come from uh, the UK government, because sometimes the consequentials don't turn out to be exactly what they appear, every single penny will go to helping low-income families. And that will be in addition to the other sources of support that I've just outlined, the £130 support payment, all of the other steps were taken, the doubling of the carers' allowance, the, the seven benefits that don't exist anywhere else in the UK that Social Security Scotland is already delivering. We do act to use our powers and our resources. But this cost of living crisis is being caused by UK government decisions uh, that they are taking within their reserved powers. Uh, and we can't go on raiding a finite devolved budget to mitigate the impact of those. We need to get these powers out of the hands of UK governments and into the hands of this Parliament. And as long as Anna Sarwar uh, prefers keeping these powers in the hands of Boris Johnson, he will not have the credibility he wants to have before this chamber. We move to supplementary questions and I call Rachel Hamilton. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mike Coffey from SRUC said, with the state of the planet, we need to do something rather urgently. We no longer have the luxury of having decades to breed plants and animals. The Roslyn Institute, the NFUS, the SRUC are all concerned that this SNP government are adopting an outda outdated EU position in rejecting gene editing instead of grasping science and innovation and putting rural farmers in Scotland on the back foot. Can I ask the First Minister, does she agree with David Mishy of the NFUS that gene editing will benefit animal welfare, public health, the environment and farmers? First Minister. I've not seen those comments in full. I'm happy to look at them and uh, consider them carefully. These are serious issues. Uh, but I, I think the quality uh, of our food and our agriculture is really important. Um, I don't support uh, GM crops, and I think uh, the opposition to that is important. I know we're not talking about exactly the same thing, but I think it's important we consider all of this thing, uh, these things uh, carefully. So I'll consider the comments and uh, be happy to say more when I've had the opportunity to do so. Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. While in Washington last week, Boris Johnson claimed that the US ban on imports of lamb had been lifted. UK government memos obtained by the Daily Record, however, reveal that the ban has not been lifted and that the PM has been, and I'm quoting here, um, from UK civil servants, misleading. Does the First Minister agree that the way the Tories are treating the industry is quite frankly disgraceful and that Boris Johnson must apologise and set the record straight? First Minister. I, I, Jim Fairley appears to be suggesting uh, that not everything that comes out of the mouth of Boris Johnson can be relied upon. I mean, perish, perish the thought. Perhaps uh, the more pertinent question is if uh, anything that comes out of the mouth of Boris Johnson can be entirely uh, relied upon. But Jim Fairley is absolutely right. I, I think uh, the Prime Minister does owe an apology because clearly what he said um, is not the case and, of course, has been described as misleading. But, of course, this is a... UK government that has betrayed uh, our, our farmers, uh, our fishermen, our entire agricultural sector um, and each and every day right now it is paying the price of the Tory Brexit and that price is getting higher and higher with every day that passes. So perhaps an apology not just uh, for a misleading statement in terms of uh, the import ban on lamb but an apology for all of the damage that this UK government has done uh, through Brexit would indeed be appropriate. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the furlough scheme comes to an end. The most recent figures showing that over 100,000 people in Scotland were still on furlough. While the headlines may be discussing uh, labour shortages, labour market statistics show that the number of jobs in the economy is still significantly below pre-pandemic levels. While the Transition Training Fund is welcome, it will account for a small fraction of this jobs shortfall. So does the First Minister think her government is doing enough to help those who may be finding themselves out of work at the end of this month, given the stress, anxiety and impact on household finances they will be finding themselves in. First Minister. Uh, we will continue to do everything we can and I think it is a fair question about uh, the need for us to look on an ongoing basis at whether we are doing all that we reasonably can to help low-income families, to help those who are unemployed and I certainly give the assurance that we will do that on an ongoing basis. Uh, but in a sense my answer comes back to the answer I gave to Anna Sarwar. Uh, we are, I'm afraid, suffering the impact and people across the country are suffering the impact right now of decisions that are beyond the control of this government and this parliament. Um, and there will always therefore be a limit to what we can do to mitigate the impact of those decisions. Uh, it would be far better if we didn't have to go cap in hand to a UK government to ask for furlough to be continued. It would be much, much better if we could take these decisions here in this democratically elected parliament in Scotland. So perhaps uh, if Labour are serious about these issues, as I, I respect the fact that the member is, they've got to stop this position of just uh, willing the ends uh, of, of things. They've got to get into a position uh, where they give this parliament the means to do the things yeah. that we all want it to be able to do. <laughs> Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, just as we've been sitting here listening to the exchange about vaccine passports, I've been contacted by a hospitality venue in the Highlands who says that they host weddings uh, there's one tomorrow night, actually. He understands that all guests will need to provide evidence of two vaccinations to be allowed in. There's music, there's dancing, uh, and all the rest. Some of the guests are family members, and they're over from China. Will they be allowed in? First Minister. Uh, as we have made clear, weddings are exempt uh, from the vaccine certification scheme. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the announcement of a temporary visa scheme to tackle 
skills shortages. First Minister. Uh, we discuss these matters on an ongoing uh, basis with the UK Government. Um, I uh, have made very clear, this Government has made very clear on many, many occasions our opposition to the immigration uh, policies of the UK Government and uh, in particular the ending of free movement. We welcome anything uh, that enables more people uh, to come here to work. Uh, but the changes to the visa rules that were announced last week, I think to describe them as a, a sticking plaster uh, would uh, be an exaggeration because I don't even think they amount to that woefully inadequate and I'm afraid uh, the price of these policies is going to be paid uh, and felt by people across the country for some time to come. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Abortion rights are under attack around the world and here in Scotland women are being harassed when trying to access abortion clinics safely. The implementation of buffer zones around clinics has stalled and campaigners like Back Off Scotland are looking to the Scottish Government for leadership and support. Does the First Minister agree that anyone accessing abortion health care in Scotland should be able to do so safely and free from harassment? And will the Government reassess its position on legislating for abortion clinic buffer zones? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I uh, am a very strong believer in a woman's uh, right to choose on the issue of abortion. Uh, and if it's possible, I'm an even uh, stronger uh, advocate, uh, as I think everybody should be, regardless of different views on abortion, that any woman uh, having an abortion should be able to do so without uh, any fear uh, or reality uh, of abuse or harassment. I, I do believe uh, there is work to be done to make sure that that uh, is the case. And uh, I, I think uh, my part his manifesto, uh, as other manifestos did, uh, had things to say on this in the election, and we will be uh, considering uh, steps that we can take to make sure that that uh, is a right that women can exercise in reality. Beatrice Wishart. Reputational damage is being caused to some Shetland businesses as Transport Scotland fails to address the needs of adequate year-round ferry freight capacity. A removals company with forward bookings cancelled resulted in a house owner sitting on the floor in the new empty home. Just one recent example. There can be no economic growth without sufficient infrastructure, but this matter has been raised before and the response is that pinch points are recognised and all options are being considered. There is growing frustration and anger in the aisles that no interim solution has been found. So can the First Minister indicate what Transport Scotland does with the freight information that Northern Isles stakeholders provide to it, and when is the Scottish Government going to address this very serious problem? First Minister. Um, I know the Transport Minister has been engaged on these issues. I absolutely agree uh, around the importance of them. Uh, obviously, there is a planned uh, development around uh, two new freight uh, vessels, which will help to address the issue in the longer term. But the Transport Minister has also given an assurance uh, that work is underway to explore potential shorter term actions that will alleviate some pressures on the busiest uh, sailing. So I will uh, ask the Transport uh, Minister to write directly to the member if she wants to provide any more details of the particular case that she has cited here. Um, that will be passed on as well, and I will ask uh, Graham Day to provide uh, more details of the work that is underway to resolve this in the shorter term um, as well as the longer term. Question number three, Gillian Mackay. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the ongoing econo economic impact on Scotland of Brexit. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government has estimated that the new EU-UK relationship could cut Scotland's GDP by around 6.1 per cent. Uh, that would be equivalent to £9 billion in 2016 cash terms uh, by 2030 compared uh, to continued EU membership. Uh, in particular, we have forecast that one of the immediate impacts would come from challenges in recruiting and retaining EU citizens as workers here, and so indeed that is proving. Uh, the fuel crisis, uh, the labour and skills shortages that are being experienced across the economy, um, and indeed public services right now, uh, I think lay bare the economic recklessness of this hard Brexit. Uh, the UK Government pressed ahead with leaving the EU despite repeated, repeated requests to delay, uh, and everybody across the country is now seeing the result of this short-sighted ideology everywhere we look today. Julian Mackay. The people of Scotland never voted for Brexit. Now we're faced with soaring energy prices, four courts running dry. There's a labour shortage affecting sectors from care to haulage. We're even threatened with shortages of iron brew if this case is, isn't urgently addressed. The Conservative response to this is a pathetic offer of a three-month visa for EU truck drivers. 
It is clear that the Tories have nothing to offer Scotland but cuts, hardship and cruelty. And with their latest plans for replacing EU subsidies, they are yet again taking powers from this Parliament and threatening our plans for a green recovery. Is the First Minister concerned about this latest power grab and will she reaffirm her commitment, as outlined in our cooperation agreement, that the people of Scotland will be given a way out of Boris Johnson's Brexit Britain with a referendum on Scotland's future before the end of this Parliament? First Minister. Uh, yes. I thought it was interesting, as Gillian Mackay was asking uh, that very, very pertinent uh, question, that the Tories were getting very, very twitchy because they don't like hearing, they don't like listening to the reality of the damage their policies are doing to people the length and breadth of Scotland. Uh, but they will not be able to hide from that damage uh, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, on immigration in particular, having spent uh, the time in the run-up to the Brexit referendum and, and since the Conservatives giving the impression that people from other countries are not welcome to work here, uh, they now, of course, uh, want people to come here for three months to help the UK government out of the self-imposed crisis, only to send them back again on Christmas Eve. It is absolutely disgraceful. And I think we've heard across a range of issues today uh, the, the real uh, need uh, and power of the argument uh, for this country to be independent so that we can take these decisions ourselves, so that we are no longer dependent on the decisions of a UK government uh, and we can respond to the needs uh, of people across this country here in the democratically elected parliament of our nation. So yes, I do uh, continue uh, to believe uh, and indeed intend that this will be the case, that people uh, across this country will have the opportunity to choose independence in a referendum within this parliament and I hope within the first half of this parliament. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, presiding officer. Does the First Minister agree with me that local authority budgets have been badly affected by the disastrous Tory Brexit deal, where councils such as Aberdeenshire are struggling to repair potholes because contractors cite additional costs relating to supplies and staff? I would just like to ask colleagues to please bear in mind that we are all wishing to hear the questions asked. I am hopeful, First Minister, that you heard the question. I, I did hear the question. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, and, and people will draw their own conclusions, Presiding Officer, that the, the Tories don't want people to hear yeah. these questions yeah. because they hope people will not see the damage that Tory policies are doing to people across this country. But people are feeling it in their jobs, they're feeling it in their pay packets, they're feeling it in their energy bills, uh, and they will see it and they will know exactly who is responsible. In terms of local government budgets, uh, during a decade of Tory austerity, we sought to treat local government as fairly as possible, and we will continue to do that. But whether it's austerity or Brexit, we see the damage the Conservatives are doing, which is why more and more people do think that this country should be independent. Question number four, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government has had and plans it has made with key Scottish industries to support vulnerable households this winter. First Minister. Well, I've already, uh, in answer to previous questions, set out the range uh, of measures we are taking to directly support uh, vulnerable households uh, across this winter. Uh, more generally, uh, we are engaging uh, with people and businesses across the country. Uh, we've been engaging with industry and consumer groups, including fuel poverty organisations, uh, to develop plans for what we can reasonably do to further support those in vulnerable circumstances. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson, uh, has also met with the UK Secretary of State. Uh, he did so on Monday this week, where he pressed for further UK government action on skills industry and for support for the most vulnerable, uh, and we intend to keep making that case. Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister knows, there is just one week to go before the UK Government cuts universal credit, plunging over 60,000 families and 20,000 children in Scotland into poverty. Tory MSPs have spent this week defending the indefensible. And will she join me in saying to the Tories, it's not too late, do the right thing, defend your constituents, and stand with the Scottish Parliament against these cuts. First Minister. Yes, I do. 
I mean, obviously, uh, as part of uh, the cut and thrust of democracy and, uh, and political debate, I, I disagree um, and oppose uh, many of the UK government's policies, as you know, the Conservatives will oppose many of the policies of this government. But I don't think there has been anything quite so morally, morally indefensible as this cut to universal credit that is planned to take effect in a week. Uh, taking, at this time in particular, £20 a week away from the most vulnerable, lowest income uh, households across the country simply cannot be defended uh, in any way, shape or form. And, and I do say uh, to the Conservatives here, if Douglas Ross wants to uh, get off his phone for a moment while we're talking about this really serious issue, uh, I would say uh, to the... Conservatives in this chamber, please, over the next few days, uh, try to persuade your UK government colleagues not to do this, because it is your constituents, just as it is mine and the constituents of every member in this chamber, uh, who are going to find it difficult to feed their children, uh, to pay their energy bills um, and to uh, live uh, with dignity if this cut goes ahead. For goodness sake, let's all of us unite to say to this UK government, do not do this. Question number five, Miles Briggs. Thank, thank you, President Officer. To ask, the Scottish, uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that in the last year ministers overturned almost 50 per cent of planning applications. First Minister. Well, it's simply uh, incorrect uh, to say that uh, ministers have overturned uh, almost 50 per cent of planning applications. Uh, the vast majority of planning appeals are decided by independent reporters from the Planning and Environmental Appeals Division of the Scottish Government. It is right and proper that ministers have no involvement in cases delegated to reporters. In the last financial year, 135 decisions on planning appeals were made uh, and planning permission granted on 67 occasions. Um, however, in the same period, local planning authorities decided approximately 25,000 planning applications, of which 94.5% were granted planning permission. So planning approvals issued by reporters were approximately 0.3% of the planning permissions granted over the course of this year in Scotland. That's my response to that claim, Presiding Officer. Miles Briggs. Officer, we know the National Planning Framework 4 will give Ministers additional powers over local planning. Council leaders, and this is Council leaders including your own First Minister, voiced real concerns about the impact of government proposals of, around centralisation of services and further loss of local accountability and decision making, including plans around the drug and alcohol partnerships and children's services being swept up in proposals set out for a centralised system. Can I ask a very simple question of the First Minister? By the end of this Parliament, Will the councils have fewer or more powers? First Minister. We seem to have gone from planning applications to children's services. Uh, we work in partnership uh, with local authorities to make sure we're delivering for people across the country. But let's go back to uh, planning uh, applications. There's no centralisation uh, here. As I said, 25,000 planning applications uh, decided by local planning authorities. Uh, the vast majority of them, 94.5% granted planning permission. Uh, 135 decisions on planning appeals uh, made uh, through the arrangements I set out within the Scottish Government. And actually in 2020-2021, Scottish ministers made the final decision on four recalled uh, planning appeals. So the whole premise uh, of this question is deeply, deeply flawed, which is probably why Miles Brigg chose to go into something else uh, after my first answer rather than stick with the subject matter of his question. Ariane Burgess. On the subject of planning uh, and the national planning framework, um, which will be published and consulted on soon, um, the I would like to ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government intends to publish the National Planning Framework participation statement setting out the consultation process. First Minister. Um, I'm very happy to get back to the member uh, with the, the date, if we have set a date uh, on which that will be uh, published, um, and I'll uh, write to the Minister, ask the relevant uh, Minister to write to the member as soon as possible. Question number six, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that social care services in Glasgow have been temporarily suspended because of staff shortages. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, say that I think all of us understand how vital these services are to uh, many people uh, and understand uh, the concern that any changes to the operation of such services uh, brings. Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership has uh, sought to assure the government uh, that this suspension of day services is 
temporary. It will be regularly reviewed and services uh, will be reinstated as quickly as possible. Uh, we have been and will continue to work closely with all local areas, including Glasgow, to ensure that services are delivered safely. Uh, this, of course, has included measures to address recruitment and retention issues, uh, such as working with the Scottish Social Services Council and key partners to promote opportunities and encourage take-up of vacant posts. Uh, this includes work on training and developing the workforce. And In addition, we are running a campaign to attract more people to the sector and accelerating the routes into the sector in recruitment processes. Pam Duncan Clancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but people who require care will probably find little comfort in that. Glasgow City Council last week took the operational decision to suspend daycare services on the basis of mounting staff pre staffing pressures in what has been described in, as a critical shortage of care workers, a shortage I as a care user am acutely aware of. Does the First Minister accept that there is a crisis in social care recruitment? that her government's continued year-on-year -year underfunding of local authorities and social care has impacted on the vacancies and the pay available. And can I ask the First Minister how many vacancies there are currently in social care in Scotland, whether the government will commit to publishing this information, what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the crisis, including the grossly unfair low pay in the sector? First Minister. Well, I think there are a number of perfectly reasonable questions uh, involved there. Firstly, I, I will undertake to uh, consider whether, uh, obviously, uh, local authorities generally are the employers of social care workers, uh, so this data is likely to be held mainly by local authorities. I will undertake to look at whether we can uh, publish the kind of information that Pam Duncan Glancy is asking for, so that we do have uh, greater understanding and transparency around uh, the level of vacancies. Um, secondly, I absolutely agree uh, that notwithstanding my answer and probably notwithstanding this answer, this will be of profound concern to anybody who is affected by this temporary sus suspension of services and everybody wants to see that uh uh, reinstated as quickly as possible. Um, we will continue across this chamber to have debates about funding. Uh, we are increasing funding to social care and it's important that we do that. I think there is a recognised need to drive up the pay and conditions of the social care workforce, which is part of our national care service proposals, but needs to be progressed uh, leading up to that as well. So I take all of this very seriously. I don't want to get back into exchanges that we've had earlier on um, about Brexit, but what I would say is we are facing uh, a shortage of labour in this country that is affecting, as we see right now, uh, haulage companies and, and many aspects of the private sector. But we all have to recognise that this is affecting our health and care sector too and is likely uh, to, to exacerbate in the, the coming period. The Scottish Government, in fact, the Health Secretary and I were discussing this yesterday with officials, uh, have a number of uh, plans uh, in progress to try to increase recruitment into social care, um, and we will uh, do everything we can. Uh, but this is one of the, the impacts of decisions that have been taken over recent years that is going to be very difficult for us uh, in the coming months, uh, and I think we all have to recognise that and resolve to do everything we can to overcome it. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We will now point of order, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, yesterday in this chamber, during the debate on the drug death crisis, SNP MSP Jim Fairley suggested that the Scottish Conservatives were, and I quote, cynically using the death toll that drugs are taking in our communities to attack the Scottish Government. That kind of language, presenting officer, I would suggest, goes beyond the robust debate we want in this chamber. And to those of us who have stood up over the past few years from across the floor and from all parties, represented our communities and debated this issue with a view to finding solutions, this is offensive. If Mr Fairley is suggesting that opposition parties should not use their debating time to highlight a crisis that sees Scotland as the drug death capital of Europe, and the First Minister concede that the Scottish Government have taken their eye off the ball, then I'm not sure what we're supposed to use our time for. It is because of the drug death rate that we continually raise this matter, and I know that members from across all political parties recognise this and work constructively to help tackle this shame. Now, I do recognise that Mr Fairley is one of the newer members of this place, and I would like to put on record he is someone I do have respect for and work with in committee, and perhaps he would use this time to reflect on the use of inflammatory language. But that brings me uh, to someone who should know better. The SNP Chief Whip stated that Conservatives are playing political games while people's lives are at stake, and that apparently it was a damn disgrace. Now, he may be relishing his time in the spotlight, 
But since the start of this pandemic some 18 months ago, the Scottish Government has consistently reassured this Chamber that it would bring important decisions to the Parliament for approval and scrutiny. To ask the Scottish Government to adhere to their own commitments should not result in a chief whip of this Government suggesting that we are putting lives at stake. It is because people's lives are at stake that we continue to press for this information. <laughs> Presiding, officer. Presiding Officer, you know I am an advocate of robust, even heated debate in this Chamber, but I have to say that the language that is creeping into debate is deteriorating. It took the First Minister herself has suggested we need to consider our behaviour and language in here. Presenting officer suggesting that anyone is using the death of others or that we are putting lives at risk for questioning the Scottish Government, I would say is unparliamentary and is going too far. I seek your opinion on whether or not parliamentary protocol has been breached. I thank Mr Whittle for his point of order. He is entirely correct that while debates in this chamber can be robust, they must also be conducted in terms that demonstrate courtesy and respect for other members. The Deputy Presiding Officers and I will always intervene where we feel that language has been used that is not acceptable. MSPs have a leadership role in their communities and across Scotland. The way in which we conduct debate in this Parliament should set a positive example to people across the country, and I would ask all members to reflect on this in relation to their conduct in the Chamber. Point of order, Rona Mackay. Thank you. Um, the, uh, Brian Whittle has several times referred to the Minister for Parliamentary Business as the Chief Whip, which is incorrect. Thank you, Thank you Ms Mackay. Your comments are on the record. We now move to the next item of business, which is members' business. Please leave the chamber quietly. Thank you. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.